10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Hello, Alex. Hey, Mike. How's it going? Good. How are you? <laughs> Pretty good. Did you like my countdown? I did. We had to <laughs> pretend like we weren't just talking while we were waiting. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, hi, everybody who's watching. I hope you can hear me okay. This is a slightly different setup than my usual one. Um, as usual, tell me if one of us is too loud or too quiet, because this is also different mics that I'm using. So I want to know if you can't hear me or you can't hear Alec. Um, and I'm very happy to welcome Alec to the Messy Desk show stream thing that I do. Um, we're going to have a really fun conversation, and Alec is going to share some new music he wrote, which is awesome. Um, quick housekeeping. Uh, people, please uh, share and like the stream. It helps a lot if you do so. You can also check out the Patreon and everything else in, in the description. And there's also a download link for the first of Alec's new preludes that he wrote there. So you can get some, some free music to check out written by this guy. But um, do you want to tell us a bit about yourself, Alec, before we hear some music, just Spark Notes version for the audience? Uh, sure. So I'm uh, based out of Vancouver right now, originally from Calgary or around Calgary like you. I did my undergrad in uh, Montreal, so I hope I have some friends out east tuning in. And uh, I'm the instructor at UVC, uh, University of British Columbia, and I'm the chair of the Vancouver Classic Guitar Society as well. So work really hard to help organize events here in town. And uh, we can talk a little bit about uh, the Okanagan Guitar Festival, which was something I was starting to organize for this year, but of course had to get canceled because of COVID. So we can talk about that later. Right, yes. It's a hard uh, time to be an arts organizer or an artist in general, like anything to do with arts, basically, especially music. Um, yeah, anyhow. Um, cool, nice. And we're gonna, the feature, like I guess the, the focus today is these new preludes you wrote. Uh, although we heard some awesome uh, Guado in the intro, um, in the countdown. But um, we're gonna play, there's four of them and we're gonna play them in order throughout the show. So do you wanna tell people about the first one before we hear it? Uh, sure, so um, I've always, actually my first passion before I decided to study performance was composition. And uh, then during my undergrad, I sort of decided to focus on the performance route, especially I, I sort of thought like, well, I'm young, I should maybe like get my performance chops up. I really wanted to be able to see what I could do on the guitar. And uh, it's only been over maybe about the last year that it, or year and a half that I started to get back into composition. And uh, I wrote a three movement piece about a year ago. Uh, which isn't going to be featured today. And then this, these pre, uh, preludes are like the first thing I've composed since that work. Um, the first one, I dedic I'm dedicating each one to a teacher that I had that had a big influence. So this one is dedicated to Bernard Blary. Uh, who, I didn't tell any of them that I'm dedicating it, it to them. So <laughs> if they're watching, it might be a surprise. Nice. Um, yeah, and he was the first real uh, music teacher I had. Uh, he's actually a flautist, but I studied harmony and piano with him. Cool. And then we stayed friends for a long time and we played a lot of duets together. He's in Vancouver now. Um, yeah, and it's just a, a simple, simple piece uh, structurally and harmonically. And that's sort of been what I'm going for in my compositions these days, just like a lot of clarity. So cool. you'll hear. Nice. And uh, people, if you have questions for Alec, please put them in the chat or for me. Um, we'd love to hear your thoughts on the music and get any questions you have or any other topics you want us to address. Um, cool. Okay, let's listen to the first of the four preludes here.
beautiful. Thanks. Very nice. Yeah, I wanted to mention too, I forgot that uh, a good friend of mine, Trevor Cooper, uh, guitarist based in Edmonton, uh, also has a little recording of this prelude too. So after I put up like a really rough copy on my Instagram, he asked me for the music and I sent it to him and uh, nice. he learned it in like two or three days and put up his own copy. So if you want to hear someone else playing that, and it like is really interesting for me because I had never had someone else play my music to hear like how someone else interprets it, you know? Mm -hmm. That's and cool. actually gave me gave me a few good ideas too like oh yeah i kind of like how you did that <laughs> yeah awesome trevor's great a shout out to edmonton i'm originally from just outside edmonton so um yeah that's awesome uh and if maybe if someone in the chat can find trevor's video on youtube they can put it in the chat also for people to go watch it'd be cool um nice well I, and also this this prelude that you, that you just played is uh, available for download through the link in the description right you put it up there last night so yeah that's right yeah the unfortunately the rest aren't for sale yet they'll be there on that page eventually but um yeah people who want to play it can can download that one for free which is really cool um yeah very generous it's the e it's the easiest to play of the four i think so right should be the most enjoyable to just sit down and pick it up and yeah yeah nice i i tell you man since i finished my master's well my second master's which we'll talk about the fact that we both have two masters in a second here but um when i finished <laughs> the masters recently a few months ago i sat down with like all these smaller pieces and i was just like this is so refreshing and like learning the yobet catalan folk songs learning some like small dowel and stuff like a bunch of other random small things because i just so focus on so many big pieces right in the masters and then it's really nice sometimes to just sit down and play something smaller. Yeah, it's super important to do that. I'm trying to really push like all my undergrad students at UBC to take easy, like, I think it's important to work on like a variety of stuff. So you have pieces that are kind of challenging you, pieces mm -hmm. that are sort of right in your lane, and then also pieces that are easy for you and that like you can have a total technical demand over mm -hmm. and just make them like super polished and yeah. they don't give you an anxiety. And I think, we tend to really neglect like that part of our repertoire. <laughs> For sure. I also think that like there's a problem. I mean, I've talked about this on the show before, but there's a problem between how we act in music school and in conservatory studies and in like a bachelor or master's studies versus how the real world is as a performer. And I think that more maybe more, maybe more players need to know that like during their studies, I made a conscious choice, for example, to play really big, hard, challenging pieces during this master's because I was working with a specific teacher, Carlo Maipione. I wanted to work on specific things, but actually when I performed during that time, I was playing totally other programs, not totally, but a mix of that stuff. Plus like stuff that was much easier for me to have demand over and like communicate and then made a better concert. Right. And I just think like, yeah, that's smart that you're telling your students that because I, mean, I think a lot of students don't necessarily get the message that like programming smaller, easier stuff is actually good for the variety of your program and good for you as a player. Right. When you're on stage um, and we kind of, go through all of our studies just constantly pushing ourselves and then sometimes when people play concerts they play those kind of concerts you know yeah and that's not always successful so yeah one thing i try to like emphasize also with those easier works is that uh they're easier to bring back to right yeah so if you have if, if suddenly you have an opportunity to perform but it's on, on shorter notice and you need something to fill up some time which happens then, a lot as a professor. Which happens a lot, yeah. Or, and also just like not a recital performance, but like gigs and stuff like that. You need like a nice repertoire of these pieces that you can draw from, yeah. that you can have ready a lot quicker. And mm -hmm. also when you're preparing those two, like thinking about sometimes fingerings, like maybe uh, what do you want this fingering to be like for a recording? So it's gonna be like the absolute perfect fingering, or do you want it to be like a very practical fingering? Yes. that like you can bring back really quickly right so thinking about like what, what purpose does this piece have yeah often in chamber music i will if i have a chamber music gig that i get like a week before i have to f full, fill in for someone i will pick fingerings that i know aren't musically ideal just because i only have like that week maybe i have two hours to practice that program properly between all my teaching and my other stuff and whatever other recordings i have to make or things i have to do and so for those two or three hours that i have to prepare that rep I know that I have to pick fingerings that are going to stick in my brain, not ones that are yeah. maybe ideal musically, right? So, just ones that are very practical and familiar to the other what uh, what else is in your hands, right? Yeah, and also like 
yeah what you say about the like having these pieces around to bring back is important too as a professional like we um you know i have a separate binder actually for that kind of stuff and it's like sort of divided into categories of like sort of more cla serious classical quote unquote like for a real recital that i can bring back that's still manageable for me to relearn stuff like the villa Lobos preludes those kind of things that like if i need to relearn them in a week i can but like they're not they're not just like gig music they're for and then you have stuff that's like for background music you know like you need to have all this stuff yeah. sort of ready and i think if you think about that as a student then when you graduate or as you get more opportunities while you're studying you'll be in a better spot right yeah 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 and, and the other advantage of those small pieces is because they're easier to bring back they're easier to have over like a greater period of time which mm -hmm. is like one thing it's like a big mistake I made when I was a student is I was always so excited to like learn the new rep that I let a lot of the old rep go too soon right or didn't hold on long enough and then I remember like going to to study in Spain and there's some guys that just sounded like so good it's like oh like how long have you been playing that piece for like oh like four or five years yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, like exactly. oh, I don't have anything I've been playing that long <laughs> yeah no I mean this is thing with like and, and also and yeah I think I don't know if this is maybe a European American, like North American thing, but once I moved to Europe, I, I found that people had a lot more sort of polished programs like that where they would play. And even I was surprised that in the conservatory, at least where I was going in Maastricht, it was normal for your exam to pick stuff that was older if you felt like it would give a better exam. You know, even if yeah. you worked on different things with your teacher all year, you might pick something for your final exam that was from the past and you polish it up with your teacher in the last two months, you know which I feel like in North America, at least at, in Calgary and in Vancouver, I didn't experience that so much. So I don't know if that's a difference in mentality or not, but I think it's important to think about when you program things that you've been playing and how long you've been playing them. Um, yeah. Anyhow, uh, I also would like, maybe you can give people a bit of context for what you, like what you're, I know you're now a UBC instructor, so that's really awesome. but what you what your background was in studying like I know your story but um, maybe you can tell people a little bit about where you've studied and, and how you got to where you are now what you've done as a musician oh sure so um so I went through let's see where where how far back to go right so I guess I started Alberta, playing so yeah I'm from Alberta I started playing guitar at about 14 uh, I could already read music because I played saxophone and in high school band and it's just that that part of music I was always pretty good at was uh, reading the music. Mm -hmm. So I remember uh, the main influence for me to take up classical guitar was actually from my uncle who played classical guitar. He's oh, probably cool. the only person in my family that had like a real musical inclination, like at least in my immediate family. Mm -hmm. um, and I yeah I remember visiting him. He lives in Arizona, and I was had like my classical guitar and I was playing some like little licks by the Pixies and Nirvana and like Jimi Hendrix and stuff. He's like, ah, like, why don't you try this? And he plops down like the Segovia uh, sore studies, the 20 studies <laughs> down cool. in front of you, which is like probably not the best spot to start for someone who's never played <laughs> classical guitar, but yeah, no kidding. I still with those. <laughs> yeah. But anyways, like after trying to play like the first one there in, in C major, um, then I was like hooked and it took me a while to find a good guitar teacher. Uh, and cause I wasn't actually living in Calgary. Like I'm from Airdrie just outside of Calgary. So mm -hmm. not a lot of classical guitar teachers in Airdrie, but I found a, a guy just in North Vancouver named, uh, Jose, uh, who at the time he was the president of the, uh, guitar society in Calgary. So I got really involved with coming Wait, out North to the Vancouver? concerts. I uh, know, sorry, North Calgary. Did oh. I say North Vancouver? <laughs> yeah, you sorry. said North Vancouver. I was like, wait. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. This long ago? I don't think that was the thing. No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, sorry, <laughs> North Calgary. Yeah, so Jose uh, Fairman. And he was the president of the Calgary Classical Guitar Society at the time. And uh, so I was doing like master classes and going out to concerts and stuff as a teenager. And uh, through that, I met Daniel Bolshoi. Mm -hmm. um, probably when I was about 16 or 17. And uh, I made the decision to go study with him. Uh, he was living in Montreal at the time. He's teaching at Concordia, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So yeah, well, I went got, to- like, You got to study in Montreal and Vancouver. You got like the two coolest cities of Canada, I think. Um, no offense to yeah. any cities in Canada, but those are like the coolest yeah, ones. Toronto. <laughs> Toronto. Well, yeah. I, 
I don't know. I don't see Toronto as that cool. I'm sorry, Torontonians, but like, it's just, I don't know. Yeah. Anyways, sorry. Yeah, no, but I, I, I agree with you. Like I loved, uh, I loved Montreal a lot and it's yeah. such a great city for the arts. Uh, a lot of times when people, like I have some friends from Europe and stuff and they talk about maybe going to Canada to study because we have lower tuition fees than like say the U S and so I always point to Montreal as like a great place to go and be in the arts you know it was the first like town i went to where you go to like a ton of local cafe and they had music playing in different genres and like all mixing together and just so many like street performers and yeah just, i love just Montreal. kind of something like it really in the air i auditioned there twice sadly jerome never accepted me but i really wanted to go actually to mcgill i was like super hyped on it um I don't think like in the end, I think Daniel was the right fit for me. Like, I don't think uh, Jerome is amazing, but I don't think he was the right fit for me at that time. Um, but like, I love that city. I mean, he's a, he's a great teacher too. It would have been awesome studying with him, but just Montreal is so cool also. Um, and like, yeah, I don't know. There's something about that city that I love every time I've been there. It's super cool. Yeah. I took a, I took a year of private lessons with Jerome, uh, in the last year of my bachelor's degree well so i did a bachelor of arts degree with a specialization in music performance okay. and there's only three years of lessons in in that degree so in the last year i had already finished all my private studies and daniel had made the move to vancouver mm -hmm. so i continued to take lessons with drone uh just privately mm -hmm. and i'm kind of surprised that he didn't accept you though i feel like he would have been really stoked to have you <laughs> no i mean I, honestly this just to be totally honest at that time when I was auditioning, I was really not very good um, because I started guitar so late that like, and I think to be honest, I owe Daniel a lot because when he accepted me, I think he accepted me largely on potential because the, the level I was playing at when I went into my first masters was not like the level it should have been just because I started at like 1920, right? Uh, guitar when I was 19, classical guitar when I was 20. So like right. by the time I went to Daniel, I think I was like 24 or something. 24, 25. So only four years after like really starting to play guitar, it's like, you you know, I was at a bachelor level, not a master level. So I think, and I, you know, I think Daniel knew from working with me a few times in Alberta that like I was improving really fast. Right. And I think, yeah, I don't, I don't know but, his mind. I can't read his mind, but I, I have a feeling that he kind of knew that I would do well given like some, you know, investment and stuff. So I, I yeah, you know, he really helped me out a lot. Um, and you know, we both know he's a great teacher. So it really counts for a lot if you get to work with a teacher before you go study with them. Yeah. And, and he uh, saw me over like two years of being in Calgary, kind of coming to the festival there. He saw like, as I was yeah. improving. So that, I think that made a difference, but yeah, I don't, I don't blame Jerome at all. Cause those auditions, I did not play very well, you know? Yeah. There's also, you know, after like being a university like teacher, there's a lot of things that happen sort of behind the scenes that you don't really think of when you're a student, like, the guitar department is usually a part of the strings department. So yeah. if they have a particularly strong showing in like violin and cello that year, they might not want to take as many guitar right. students because yeah. they have to balance everything out. Yeah, it's always hard to tell. I mean, with auditions, I, I did so many auditions over my three degrees um, because I also took a year off between each one and like tried to go into different schools and sort of weighed my options. Like I got accepted to San Francisco, but didn't go because it was too expensive. And like, I just feel like after doing so many auditions, it's kind of like, I, I don't think that you should see an audition result or even a competition result as any kind of indication of your like worth as a musician, right? It's just like, yeah, there are all these factors you don't know. So you can't even really say with confidence that the teacher didn't want you or they did want you or whatever, you know? Yeah. I also actually took a year off um, between high school and doing university as well. Okay. Yeah. Did you find like when you took a year off between schools that that you think that was like worth it? Like is the right move? I think so. I mean, in the case of between the bachelors and my first masters, I did it because I got into the only school I got into that was San Francisco because um, I didn't apply to too many. And, and uh, Mark Teicholtz wanted me to come study with him, which was an amazing opportunity, but I just couldn't pay the tuition like in the U.S. And I decided I didn't want to end up in the U.S. because I didn't think it was a great place to be an artist necessarily when you graduate, you know, or is more difficult at least. Um, yeah. so unfortunately I couldn't go stay with Mark. I really wanted to, I was pretty heartbroken at the moment, at the time actually, but it was really good to have a year. Like I was doing Skype lessons with Toma Bilito, um, because I had had really good master classes with him when he was in town. Um, uh, and actually that was when he was in Montreal. So like when I went to audition in Montreal, he wasn't teaching at the school there. He was still doing his PhD, but like 
you know, I would go take lessons in person with him when I traveled to that city and the Skype lessons were really good for me. Um, just cause in Calgary, I was, I had a teacher who I really liked, but I wanted a second opinion on some things. And it was good for me yeah. to have a year cause I, I got more experience performing and I made my first CD, like all that kind of stuff, you know, like it was nice to have a year to do my own projects, which I think, yeah, I think it's good for musicians to be on their own a little bit too outside of school sometimes. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah. But um, anyway, sorry, you were saying, so you went to Concordia with Daniel and then you took a year lessons with Jerome and then you went to Vancouver to do a master's with Daniel, right? Yeah, that's right. So I think I was, um, uh, me and one other, one other student and I were uh, the first two uh, people to do the master's in Vancouver cool. uh, with Daniel. And then, you know, right after that, you know, he, it, that program kind of really blossomed. And I think at, at what, at the year that you did it, maybe your second year, I think it had the most students at one time, which was like six students or six or eight. Yeah. There were four, six, yeah. Eight students. Yeah. There were, there, I think there were six master's students and then a few bachelor's students, right? Yeah. There yeah. was one, one year you had more masters than bachelor's, I think. Yeah. And that was the, and the, the I, got, I came in the year that he brought in four master students at once, which was amazing. Yeah. Um, it, Cause it was like Kyle, Joel, me and Jacob. So, so it was really exciting to see at that time I was already finished, but I, you know, I could see how the program was growing with Daniel. And I thought, mm -hmm. of course, that's one of the reasons why I followed Daniel because I knew that he had this kind of like energy towards mm -hmm. the guitar and I wanted to be a part of that. Right. I learned so much from Daniel. I mean, I learned so much like musically from him and technically, but also like we're talking about Daniel Bolshoi for people who don't know, I learned so much from him about how to be, a professional like musician and not just in the sense of like you know how to like promote yourself etc although he was good at that obviously like I just saw the hustle that he did he didn't even really like explicitly say any of it it was just like the way he treated people well made stuff happen and tried to make new initiatives happen and like encouraged us not to just worry about things like you know competing or grades or whatever but encouraged us to be really like looking at like what are we going to contribute as a musician to our community yeah. to our area and um that stuff is like super valuable you know i don't know yeah he has a lot of hustle i remember i, I read like an article it was like an interview with him and the person was asking like how he approaches his career as a musician and it's like oh it's just like you know i treat it like another nine to five job you just wake up at nine o'clock and you just work diligently until five o'clock but then every time i would send him an email he would be like replying back to me. I get these replies at like one thirty in the morning. Like, yeah. <laughs> so, so I was like, what is this like nine to five stuff you're talking about, Daniel? Yeah. <laughs> nine to one thirty. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Daniel works really hard. Um, anyways. Yeah. So you, okay, you did the masters and then, you know, you and I have a lot of things in common. We're both from Alberta. Our first guitars were by Marcus Dominelli. And then we both went to Europe after the masters in Vancouver. So yeah, that's right. <laughs> So what did you do after the master's? Oh yeah, so after I finished uh, my studies in Vancouver with Daniel, then I went to this really wonderful program in Alicante, Spain. Uh, so big shout out to that program. Um, that, that was a really eye-opening experience. That's like a six month program where they bring in uh, a different instructor for a week and then you have a week off to prepare for the next one. And each instructor is supposed to talk give a little lecture about this like stylistic period in music so maybe like 20th century repertoire or Bach or something like that something that they're really specialized in and you play two master classes from that period uh, and you watch everyone else's master classes so it's 14 students in total and uh, it's really big names like we had uh, David Russell, Pepe Romero, like Paul Galbraith, Fabio Zanon just like a huge list and uh, so you learn so much from those guys because they're amazing. Um, but you also are living with the other 13 students uh, in this program uh, together in this, it used to be like a, a nunnery that they sort of renovated. And you learn so much from all these other students because it's like a big international cohort of people. Like we had people from Colombia and of course there's some Spaniards and we had Italy, Norway, Greece, yeah all over the place i didn't do the same program but i had a bit of the same experience going to well i live in the netherlands now but moving to the netherlands and studying with carlo and master we had i think 
the classes are just so international. We had like a student from Mexico, a student from China, a student from the Philippines, a student from Norway, or sorry, Finland, uh, Finland, no, no, yeah, Finland, and then um, Portugal, Spain, France. Like it's just you know it's just crazy because in North America you don't get that same experience of like usually. I mean, in some places, of course, in the U.S. there are some schools that are like this, but you know some of the European schools you just get to like be alongside colleagues from literally all over the world, which is cool. Yeah, and you get you get learn so much about just their background in music and like their different approaches and and upbringings and it's a real source of like inspiration and for sure that's amazing um and so what what so i'm curious because i i did this too what made you want to do a second master's um and do that program and go to europe after finishing the the master's in in canada Oh, that's a, a really good question. Um, I mean, I found out about the program through Daniel Bolshoi, uh, and he encouraged me to do it. I think the year I applied, that was just their second or third year of, of the program. I'm not probably third year, I think. Um, so I, I didn't know I hadn't heard about it before. But I think a, a big part of it was that I had had Daniel for both my undergrad and my master's, which in a way was really good for me. I think it, it's really nice you know to have a really solid foundation with one teacher over time that you know kind of curates your knowledge but of course i wanted to have like these different inputs mm -hmm. and uh also i was when i moved to vancouver i was sort of thinking that it would be a place where i wanted to set up home base because i had grown up with some family um in not vancouver just but in langley like so, uh, just outside of vancouver for people who don't know so I love the the province and, and the weather and the nature. And I was thinking, well, if I, I'm going to make Vancouver my home base, I'd already lived in Montreal. Maybe it would be nice to have like an experience uh, living somewhere else before I sort of plant my roots here. Right. Because I think as an artist, it's really important to go and live in different places and experience different cultures and Mm -hmm. because you know music comes from human culture right and it's really important to get different tastes of that if you want to sort of understand where all this stuff comes from right and especially yeah. like playing guitar and having a chance to be in spain for oh, six man. months yeah we went i didn't go for six months but i went to spain last year went to um andalusia um just on a like short holiday with um my fiance and her family and we went to Granada and like it was it was amazing like um I, I think you know of course I could already play a lot of the pieces associated with that city well but like going to Manuel de Fayas like um house museum thing and I actually got to record the Faya homage to WC there because the guy let oh, me record cool. in, in the courtyard it's on YouTube actually but like doing that kind of stuff and going to the Canarilife I also recorded Funzo Canarilife nearby the Canarilife which is funny because that's literally what the title translates to but doing yeah. those kind of things like you know and Jessica and I have some duo repertoire that we play that's like guitar and voice stuff by Rodrigo that's based on some cities in that area so just like going around and sort of seeing all those things I don't know it gives you a new appreciation for the music that you're playing you know yeah you see like the the influence of like the Moorish like architecture and mm -hmm. and that you get a taste of food and smell the air and it sort of puts you a little bit more in, in like the mind of the composer, right? Yeah, and going like, I didn't even realize like the Hunza La Canarilife, you know, that piece has that lush opening, which is, I think of as like kind of the sunrise on Granada, which is so beautiful. And then it has the tremolo section, which is supposed to represent the fountains. And then at the end, it has this like really kind of out of nowhere, very like syncopated uh, sort of flamenco dance section. And I didn't realize until we spent all day going to the Canarilife and then we went to a flamenco dinner and show that night. And I realized, like, that's kind of a thing you do when you go to Granada. It's like at night you go see some flamenco um, music and, and dancing, you know. And I was like, oh, it's fitting that this ends the piece. But before it always just kind of felt like out of nowhere, this like fast section at the end, you know. Um, right. And so, I don't know, it's just stuff like that, that like connections you don't make until you have those experiences, you know. Um, yeah. But that must have been super cool living in Alicante for six months. Yeah. And the, the program's still going strong and you know they're doing they they want to sort of uh make alicante the city for classical guitar and the way that like granada is like associated with uh with flamenco right so cool. 
it'll be interesting to see what that program looks like in a few more years too. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I know a few other people who did it after you, who, like, because I'm in Europe now. I know a few people in Europe who did it after you, and um, it sounds like it's doing really well. Uh, cool. Okay. Well, I think now people have a sense of um, sort of your background, and then you you started wor working at UBC after you came back from that, right? So um, yeah, that's right. Teach now, um, but you're also the president of the guitar chair of the Guitar Society in Vancouver, which we'll talk about a little bit later. I think that's something we should address, but I want to ask you my gotcha question. And also the chat's a bit silent today. So guys, let me know if you have questions for Alec. <laughs> uh, we would love to, you know, hear your questions or your thoughts. Um, the gotcha question of the stream, which you have to answer is, how do you define classical guitar? Oh, that's a good question. How do I define classical guitar music, would you say? Just classical guitar. Or like, or like the genre, like what the genre that, of classical that, guitar. What does that term mean? How would you explain it to someone who doesn't know what classical guitar is? I guess the genre, yeah, would be fair. Yeah. But it could also um, encompass the music and the instrument too, you know? Yeah, well, it's, it's tough to say because it's like something that's very much in flux, right? And it's, it's, cross you know usually like if you say flamenco it's so easy to cement that into a particular tradition and region but classical guitar is something that's like so modern and multicultural that i think it's going to mean a lot depending on who says it mm -hmm. but i guess for me it it would be like uh the style of playing that has roots in the spanish school uh and spanish french italian school later uh, English of plucking with your fingers. So just really like a, a finger-based approach to playing music on the guitar um, and typically on an acoustic wood instrument with nylon strings, right? So like a traditional instrument. And I think that's about where I would like put the end of the borders because if you try to like define it further than that, then you're gonna start pissing someone off who's trying to do something different. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Um, yeah, I think that that's a pretty, pretty sensible definition, I would say. Um, yeah, I mean, like, of course, you can bring up all sorts of exceptions to that, but like you said, it becomes too complicated if you go any further out than that. Um, yeah, sorry, I just realized that I thought the chat was empty, but it looks like there, are, there was someone commenting on the video I shared so I just want to say hi to Steve Cowan and thanks for commenting. He says, "Oh, nice, hey Easy Steve." Music for the win. Uh, he said, "There's some value to what you're saying now, but school is also the prime time to learn as much new music as possible each year. Once you leave, learning big pieces becomes very difficult to, to find the time for." Yes, exactly. Um, that's that's why. And he says, "Yes, everyone come study in Montreal. Listen to Alec. I think he has a vested interest <laughs> since he teaches in Montreal." But um yeah I, I actually totally agree steve that's like that's what i meant before when i said that during this last masters i did like all these giant challenging pieces that weren't necessarily in my concert programs all the time like i my final exam was just like giant works that like but i would never play that exam as like a concert concert necessarily because it's just too heavy you know um so because i was doing the master's program with a teacher who i really wanted to push myself with i chose really large difficult pieces because i had the time during school kind of thing but um, yeah, that's true. I think people, yeah, there has to be a balance, I guess. Yeah, I think also it's important to sort of step back and look at what kind of road it takes to become a professional musician. And especially like in our, our field of like classical guitar, which we were just talking about. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, you, if you have this idea that you're gonna do a four year undergrad degree but then typically schooling doesn't finish there, right? Then you're going to do like a two year masters then maybe you'll do a program after that or a DMA. So you have to sort of like really realistically look at where you are on that path and then pick pieces that work with you, right? Like one of the, the biggest things I see with people auditioning is like playing repertoire that's just like frankly, like out of their league. And, wait yeah. through, and I'm guilty of it too, like before I went to study with Daniel. And like Daniel's not a teacher who like, you know, he doesn't have a reputation for giving you easy pieces. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, no kidding. Daniel, Daniel also at in this. my first master's just like dictated, not dictated, but he like made me 
play hard stuff, which was good for me, but yeah. Yeah, so there, I think you, you have to look at, there's a time when you're really building like a strong, strong foundation to your playing. And then from there, you can do more sorts of things, right? Yeah, for sure. Uh, Steve says, keep it heavy with Carlo. Now his comments appearing in my restream window in OBS. So I don't know why the other comments didn't show up, but I'll try. I hope that if people comment now, can everyone who's listening try commenting and just see if it, I, I'm just trying to, because I'm doing it. I have a slightly different setup today. So I'm like trying to see if maybe restream didn't connect properly. If you could leave a comment and I'll see if I see it or not, that would be great. Um, yeah, I guess thinking as a teacher, it's also that question of how much do you push a student? How much do you like tell them to sort of rein it in and do stuff that's like going to help them build that foundation? Um, I guess it's a balancing act, right? Yeah, it's a balancing act. And, and I think you want to layer it in a way that a student is always doing all of those things, right? So you always have something in your repertoire that's challenging you and nice. always something that's letting you work on like really polishing and uh, you can feel like really confident and secure when you get on stage with that as well, right? For sure, yeah. Yeah, and performing is different than studying. That's the thing. An exam is different than a concert, I think, to some extent. Um, yeah, for sure. Charlene Gaston said comment. Thank you, Charlene. It looks like it's working. <laughs> I appreciate the comment. Um, yeah, we did a we did a Vancouver um, online festival just a few weeks ago that our also mutual colleague Luis Medina, shout out to Luis, uh, organized, and uh, I gave a, like a little talk on performing as well. And it, in that talk, I sort of made a point to distinguish between uh, practicing and like rehearsing, right? So a lot of times people think it's like the same thing where for me, when I use the word rehearsing, it's like I have like really specific goals that I'm gearing towards like a specific performance. And it's not just about the music, but it's like about everything around the music, right? Mm -hmm. So these things that we talk about and think about on the surface, there's usually like a lot more levels to them and a lot of like little tangents and things mm -hmm. that you like really need to start exploring as you're a student. For sure, definitely. Um, yeah, that's like, and, and rehearsing in a, in a smart way and rehearsing enough, you know, instead of just practicing, that's really, really key also. Um, yeah, it just occurred to me, I am seeing the Facebook comments, but I hope that if people on YouTube are commenting uh, and I don't see it, I hope that they understand, I just can't see it. Anyways, sorry, I'll stop <laughs> worrying about the comments. Um, we're gonna move on to, <laughs> Our favorite game on this show, Alec, you ready? Oh, no. No, I'm not. We're going to do a repertoire <laughs> listening test, and the audience can join in if they want. You, you're not allowed to watch the chat, though, now, because I don't want you to cheat. Um, okay, I don't even know how to look at that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, nice. We were talking about how your social media challenge. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, so we're going to do, I'm going to play some music, some recordings, guitar recordings, and you're going to guess the piece, the composer, and or the player. So there's like a possible three points per per recording okay and uh, i'll give you some hints so like you know if you guess the composer and you get it wrong i'll let you guess like once or twice more so don't like it's not like final guess you know kind of thing um i mean after a while i'll say it's final guess but you know i am merciful um okay. and what else i've organized it into like beginner intermediate advanced but that also is kind of hard to tell what is what so um yeah, we'll see. Okay, so there's nine pieces. The first one is this recording. Wait one second. Here we go. Yeah, I got this one. Okay. <laughs> well, I should listen for the performer though. I'll, I'll play I don't another know the clip. Performer. What's the piece in the composer first? Okay, so that's uh, Viola Lobos. Yeah. And that's uh, that's a prelude number two, right? Yeah, correct. Um, and I'll play another section for the player. And I can give you a hint if you're really stumped, but. Do you want a hint? It's pretty fast. I don't know. Yeah, can um, you give me a hint? The hint would be you have You've met this player and played in master classes for them. 
Can I ask like when that might have been? <laughs> uh, Played for a lot of people in your studies. Uh, okay, is it Fabio Zanon? No, two more guesses. Uh, it's like I thought it was maybe a little too clean to be Fabio. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <no. laughs> well, yeah. Anyways. Any other ideas? No, it's tough to hear. Also, when I'm getting the sound, it sounds like really bassy. I don't know if that's the... Oh, maybe it's because it's coming through Zoom. I hope I hope that's not a problem. It's also just a slightly bassy recording, so... Yeah, it's okay. I don't think I'm going to get the, the performer, You have two more though. guesses. Come on. Uh, someone I met later. At least according to your bio. Yeah. I think this person you would have met later on at a certain program. Yeah, I don't even know what's on my bio. I need to upgrade that. Um, Could be that would I'm it also be... assuming wrong. Sorry. Yeah, uh, I don't know. Would it be? Uh, oh, what's the name. You got five seconds, or I'm just gonna tell you. Okay, why don't you just tell me, man? It's Pepe Romero. <laughs> Pepe Romero. Okay. Yeah. Did, was he was at Alicante, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, okay. Yeah. I took lessons with him. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So two that. out of three. Not bad. Not bad. Okay. Next recording. Piece number two. Sounds familiar, but I don't know. Ah, okay. Um... Any idea? No, I don't know, man. It's a Italian composer. You have a few guesses. Yeah. Um, no, I definitely heard this before. I'm sure you have. Yeah. Um, Kyle played this. Kyle plays a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah, but in his masters, he played this. I remember very specifically. He worked on it a bunch. Kyle Hawks. Yeah. Uh, if he's watching, he's going to be so mad that I don't know. This. <laughs> Alex, how could you forget? Um, uh, okay, is this, uh, is this uh, I want to say Tedesco then? It's Tedesco, correct. Yeah, and then Kyle played it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it does sound like uh, Tedesco, yes. Yeah. Um, it's got those lush chords. This section sounds very Tedesco. This one. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I don't know, man. It's gonna escape me. What okay, it's, it's the me? it's the sonata in homage to Boccherini. Ah, uh, okay, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, the player is a, a very well known Japanese player. Ooh, you want to hear some more of the playing? Uh, I mean, I'll probably just take a guess. Does the speed tell you anything? Is it uh, Shinichi? No, it's not Shinichi Fukuda. Oh, Yamashita? Yamashita, yeah. <laughs> it's so crazy. Um, actually, there's this. Sorry, I'm just. Uh, this isn't part of the game, but I want to show you just how fast he plays the Tarantella. You ready? Yeah. <laughs> speeding that up that's like literally yeah. the, the recording tempo yeah that's crazy isn't that crazy guy. i mean everybody <laughs> plays that like 
like literally half tempo of that yeah yeah it's yamashita that has all the crazy transcriptions too right yeah yeah the uh the sorks key and everything which is it yeah i'm not even sure that those pieces this these tedesco pieces sound that good that fast but anyway um still impressive okay so you got two out of three because yamashita and tedesco next one Sounds like uh, like very like Taraga. It's not Taraga, but it is Spanish. Spanish composer. Oh, okay. This composer is not a guitarist. Yeah, so we're looking at some Albanese here. Albanese, yes, Albanese. Yeah. Correct. But which one is it? Uh, it's named after a location in Spain. <laughs> <Does> <laughs> yeah, that that's help? super helpful. <laughs> yeah. uh, look, a city on the water. Oh my! You're like way overrested in aiding my geography skills. <laughs> yeah, no, I know it's not. No, it's not Sevilla. Is it? Um, it's not Sevilla. It's not Granada. <laughs> the player from the sound. Is it uh it's not Tori May uh no that's not it. No. Yeah. I can picture like the score with like the little the little triplets in there, like reading through the yeah. pieces, but I, I'm not gonna remember the the one. It's okay, it's Cadiz. Uh, Cadiz, okay. And the player, uh, also a player you worked with. It could be. <laughs> I've worked with a lot of players, man. Yeah, but I mean, um, the sound. I guess it's hard through Zoom, but I'll play a little bit more and just. David Russell. It's David Russell. Very yeah. good. Nice. He has this like, just such a like nice, elegant way of like ending those phrases, you know? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I thought you did that. Okay, cool. So in the beginner category, you got six out of nine. Not bad. All right. Next one. <laughs> It's kind of an obscure composer, but I thought you would know it because of the recording it's from, maybe. The recording is from. The player is someone that's been quite formative in your life. <laughs> that that doesn't help, man. <laughs> it doesn't help? Even okay, uh yeah, okay. Well let's is it, is it Daniel? <laughs> it's Daniel, yeah, it's Daniel Bolshoi. Play. Yeah. Um and it's another Spanish composer. Okay. Yeah, is, is it from a Sans de la Maza CD? Yes, correct. Yeah, so it's Sans de la Maza. Can you yeah. play a little bit more of it? Thank you. 
it's been a long time since I listened to it. That's a really good CD though for anyone yeah. who's listening and likes that music. It's a great it's really CD. Good. Yeah. Although the Sinister Mazza has some great music, but people don't play very often. Um, yeah. yeah. What's the What's the title of it? The piece is Homenaje a Toulouse Lautrec. Right. It's an homenaje, yeah. Nice. Yeah, but it's Daniel playing um, Sinister Mazza. Great CD. Okay, next one. <laughs> at all. Oh really? Okay, I'll play a little bit of a later section. I think it might help. I'm trying to think of the composer. It almost be, it'd almost be like Brower. It is Brower, and yeah, Anna Pierre, Pierre Toussac got it right. Correct, Anna Leo Brower. Yeah, Brower, and but I'm not sure which which one. What's the what's the piece? It's Orito de las Orishas, the right of the Orishas. Ah, right. Okay. And the player is a Cuban player. This is an older CD of his. Yeah. Ah, and I got the piece. Is it? Okay. Is it Rene? It's not Rene. Someone you've worked with, also, I believe. Really from Cuba, huh? Mm-hmm. I guess people don't necessarily always like because he teaches in in the U.S. So yeah, I'm not sure. It's Manuel Barueco. Ah, okay, that that makes sense. I should have guessed that. No worries. Okay, but you got Brower. Uh, next one. Is <laughs> <laughs> this okay um it's english guitarist english composer okay well i mean i, I obviously want to say it's bream because that sounds like music bream would play as well it's correct yeah it also sounds yeah like, very, like, <laughs> it's like super with, bream yeah super, yeah i picked this one because i thought it was like super uh almost stereotypical bream um, yeah it is very stereotypical um, yeah. oh, okay. The composer. I mean, you can try. Try just naming a few British composers who this sounds like. Maybe, maybe you'll get it. It's a bit hard, but. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it's of... the. It's it's not William Walton, right? It's not so... Walton. No, yeah, because I think he only really wrote the Baggage Bells, right? Yeah, this is like more. This is even more out there. Yeah. It's, it's, is, that, is it Malcolm Arnold? No, but that's a good guess. It sounds like Arnold, uh, actually, but it's not Arnold. Um, I know there's actually, when you think about it, there's actually a lot of these British composers that sound like this that Bream played music by. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure. Okay, I'm not sure on this it's one. It's uh, Reginald Smith Brindle. Oh, okay, Brindle, yeah. Do you know the piece? I, I don't know the piece. Okay. Yeah, I just know the composer. Right. It's El Polifemo de Oro for fragments. Okay. For guitar. But you got Bream. The Bream sound. Yeah, that's like the that's like the first piece on on a CD there, right? The yeah. Modern yes. guitar. Yeah. Yeah, modern guitar CD. Um, 20th century guitar. Um, and you know, obviously a big rest in peace. We all miss Bream already. Um, 
I actually think it would be super cool to do a stream about Bream and you know sort of like his in um, celebrating his life and stuff but I, I need to think of who to invite on for that um, maybe you could talk to uh, maybe you could talk have you talked to Tom Gamble yet no I haven't but actually I could bring Tom on I mean you know, yeah he plays a lot he's of doing a yeah, he is. Yeah, I think uh, on his Facebook there, he said he's getting ready to release like a CD of English music. Nice. So. Cool. Yeah, I should. I should. I, I actually did talk to him about bringing him on uh, at some point, but we never set up a date. But I should do that with him. All right. Next one. Uh, it's always nice to hear some Bream. Uh, next one. <laughs> with too many strings who plays his guitar in a weird way too many strings but plays his guitar in a weird way weird to the rest of us uh, yeah i don't know what to make with that <laughs> you this is also someone you worked with oh, okay so paul paul galbraith yeah He's got yeah crazy well, this, resonator yeah box and eight eight strings right yeah yeah hi he has a high a and a low b yeah so this is also a transcription it's not a guitar piece yeah well that's everything he plays is a transcription pretty much yeah because of the weird guitar <laughs> <you say>. yeah. <laughs> right yeah and actually I, I have a friend that i studied with um in in spain there he started playing one of those Brahms guitars after meeting paul there oh cool but, but the music's like so bouncy like i don't recognize it it yeah like can you stuff. recognize this this composer just from knowing classical music it's a, it's quite it's a well-known composer very well known more well known than most guitar composers like the average human would know this before they knew any guitar guitar composers for sure oh, okay is it is it uh one of his mozart transcriptions it is yes. yeah it's so weird hearing like mozart on there I know like kind of just like the color of the strings yeah um but i what don't type, know what type of piece is it <laughs> i'm guessing it's like uh is it one of the mozart sonatas correct for what instrument yeah is I'll, it I'll, I'll give it to you if you get the instrument uh, i don't know the instrument is it the one in is it in a major <laughs> uh no the, well it's it's in b flat but it's it's a keyboard oh, b -flat. Sonata. yeah i'll give it to you because you knew it was mozart and sonata um yeah, Carlo just finished a Mozart transcription for six string guitar. Um, that is apparently possible. Yeah, I think it works really good when Paul does it. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, Carlo's transcriptions are possible, but it's kind of like <laughs> possible for superhuman. No, no, I yeah. think it's, it, this this one is actually quite manageable. I have a friend who was playing it in last week before he released it. And it's really cool uh nice okay so paul galbraith oh yeah by the way in the intermediate category you got four out of nine but you're already doing okay. better so far in advance so okay next one two more and then we're done. Sounds very South American. Mm -hmm. um, but this, no, I don't know. You're gonna have to give me some hints. Uh, it is South American. You're correct. Um, how can I give you another hint? Um, this composer is, is, yes, Jose Cueto has it in the chat. This composer is known for like a lot of their most often played pieces are waltzes oh, okay it's uh laro laro correct and but what? but that doesn't yeah but the which one i don't know if you Venezuela. can name, like the set it's from then i'll give it to you uh i don't know just the how about the player i'm gonna check where this player's from I mean, this is again someone you've worked with. I tried to, you know, 
emphasize that, you can tell. <laughs> sure man it's uh it's roberto Assel. okay roberto Assel. yeah that would be the, the good guess <laughs> and uh it's it's one of the four venezuelan waltzes this one's called tatiana yeah cool okay well you got uh lauro so there you go uh last one this one's a doozy i i this was a discovery today for myself also <laughs> section here. This one is like the real hard one I put in. Yeah, I don't know, man. This is actually John Williams, like the film composer John Williams, wrote a piece for the park. Oh, Park-Nation. really? Yeah. He wrote a piece called Rounds. At least when I clicked on the name, when I looked up the piece, it said that it was at John Williams. I don't think it's the guitarist John Williams. Yeah. What year was that? This was in when did, when was this composed? And um, by the way, this is a player who has won the parking competition. Can you guess who it is? Uh, yeah, no, I don't know. I don't really follow the parking competition. Uh, that this much. is Meng Su. Okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, when was this published? Rounds for solo guitar by John Williams. Um, doesn't say here. Wait, let's see. Oh, rounds 2012. Oh, yeah, cause she won in 2012. So this must be because she did it. That was the set piece that year. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's so, interesting. Yeah. I think that 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 would be like a, a lot more popular piece just if it was composed by John Williams. Yeah, it's funny because like when I I've seen it written a bunch of times in programs, like people playing it or like people recording it online, and I've always thought, oh, I knew that he wrote. I don't know, did he write any pieces, the, the guitarist John Williams? I feel like he wrote a piece or two, or am I crazy? Um, maybe it's this piece that's making me think that, anyways. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Uh, anyhow, nice. Okay, well, good job, Alec. You got 6 out of 9 in the beginner, 4 out of 9 intermediate, and 3 out of 9 in advance. Oh, not very good. <laughs> oh, fine. This is a hard because normally in listening tests in school you have like, you know, you're given the list like three months in advance or, or three weeks in advance or something, and in this you have like the whole guitar catalog and no time to no uh, warning of what's on the test. So yeah, it's fine. Don't worry. It's still like half and half. I feel like I did I did better when I was walking watching Jacobs. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's also hard because I'm always picking the test differently, right? Um, yeah, for sure. Nice. All right, so let's listen to another one of your preludes. We're going to listen to the second prelude. Do you want to tell people about this? Uh, sure. So this one um, I'm dedicating to uh, Mark Teicholtz, uh, who I never actually like studied directly with Mark, but I've known him for so many years, and I've taken lots of lessons with him, and I've seen like so much of his teaching um, that the, just this piece made me think about him. And it sort of starts off with this... Uh, sort of like calm boat song kind of sway to it and then something a little bit more uh like a rhythmic idea comes in and then the last section of the piece is just sort of how do those two ideas like uh, fit in with each other and trying to have them like have a conversation with each other cool awesome so it's kind of a bar roll in the beginning yeah exactly awesome Nice. I love Mark too. I, I really wish I had done, had been able to do my masters with him financially. 
Um, he's such an amazing musician, amazing teacher, amazing player, amazing yeah. person. It's just, yeah, awesome person. Cool. Okay, prelude number two. Let's hear it. There you go, yeah. Some uh, It's hard to uh... Oh, go ahead. Oh, was just some sneaky like uh right hand fretting at the end. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Yeah, it's hard to sometimes it's hard to like play the thing you wrote though cuz when you're writing it like this one on my Instagram I put out like the first one and the third one and I skipped over this one because I had so many revisions of it. You know what I mean? Like just yeah. so many little things I I didn't like or I wanted to change. Yeah. So it was really hard to put like, okay, now now it's done. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Sorry, can you move the camera back left or go oh. a little bit right or something? Because no, uh, there, perfect. Getting cut off. Yeah. yeah. You're going behind go. my picture. Um, Anna Piertzak says, nice composition. Congratulations, Alec. Thanks, Anna. Yeah, if you want to play the first prelude, Anna, you can download it for free in the link in the description. So, Or if you want to just take a look at it, you know, there's a free download there yeah. of the first one. Yeah, Anna started a guitar orchestra here in, in Vancouver recently. Oh, I awesome. think there's about 10 of us here playing it and uh, all pretty high level players. So Yeah, Joel was telling me he's in it because I, <laughs> Joel and I still talk all the time because we used to be in a duo and we did the masters together, but now we just play video games together online. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Cause, nice. Because I live across the world. So we, we play every, like a couple times a week, we play Elder Scrolls online together. And so uh, I was playing with him and he's like, yeah, I started this guitar orchestra and I started going to rehearsals. He was pretty stoked about it, so it sounds like it was a good, good uh, initiative. Yeah, and is working really hard to make lots of uh, really nice transcriptions for us. So awesome. maybe I'll I'll write something for the orchestra if you want, Anna. <laughs> yeah, that would be super cool. And then you can come back on the show, and maybe you guys can feature the orchestra on the show or something. It'd be cool. Um, that would be cool. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's super cool. So actually, one of the topics I wanted to talk about was your work with the society, but like talking about these kind of things, like what Anna's doing with the orchestra sort of community initiatives where, you know, uh, it's, it's kind of something I usually touch on at least once during each podcast because I feel it's so essential for guitarists since we don't have kind of like a lot of institutional support behind us all the time. Sometimes we do, but, you know, just making sure that we're making initiatives happen ourselves in our, in our communities and then getting people interested in the guitar that way, the classical guitar that way. What is your like, yeah. sort of take on that after doing it for quite a long time, like as working for the society as the chair and, and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, well, I, you know, I think a lot of art forms sort of exist in a world where you can sort of like purchase a product that's a result of that art form. 
but uh so much of what we do like we do have like of course you can sell like cds and stuff but so much of what we do is like an experiential thing mm -hmm. so it's you know you're not just trying to sell someone something that they can take home that adds value to their life but you're trying to convince them to spend time uh away from their life that they could be doing other things to play guitar or come out to a concert and it's a lot harder to sell uh people on that like nowadays there's just we have such an abundance of things that can preoccupy our time mm -hmm. uh that trying to get someone to dedicate something their time to something like guitar uh is really is really difficult and it it's really rewarding even though it's difficult but it takes a I think it takes a community to do it and like a certain amount of education around whatever that thing is. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, th I almost think it's like a responsibility of every guitarist to spend a little bit of time trying to think about how they can work to build the community around them to incorporate guitar and incorporate learning music in general and not just guitar. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's something that doesn't just happen by itself. Yeah, and also like I almost feel like it's, I mean that it's I think it's important for us all to give back because we all benefit like every professional guitarist or student benefits from the guitar community that exists, but also it's not even just about like paying it forward. It's also about like, do you want to have a career essentially? Like if you stay in one place long enough, you know, if you don't get involved with community projects, it's very hard to make connections and. I don't mean that to, to sort of tell people to be cynical and selfish about it, but just that like, if you're not giving into the community, it's going to be hard for you to expect other people to help you out also, right? And and give you opportunities in some ways. Um, of course, sometimes you can get opportunities just by merit of being, you know, playing well or like being lucky or whatever, um, or having a project that really interests a certain organization or something. But I just mean like, I think we all kind of have to put something in, you know, if we all want to be able to get something out of the community. Um, a little bit yeah and it's uh, i think people um really underestimate how much you can learn and grow by contributing to that process of like putting something in mm -hmm. like you say like just that in itself is uh can be like hugely rewarding and mm -hmm. educational i remember when i started going to the masters of vancouver i kind of had this attitude that like i'm just focused on studying i'm gonna like do this and like when i sort of i think galena asked me to do a few things for the society and at first, I was a little bit reluctant because I was kind of like, uh, I'm like, we're going to focus on my playing and on my studying and everything. And I realized probably through the master's, I was like, actually, like, I really want this organization to succeed in this city and I want to contribute to it in some way. And it was partly by Daniel's modeling, too, that I saw how much he was putting into the society and into other places like that, that I realized how important it was. And um, it was a learning experience for sure, but it was positive uh, in the mm -hmm. end for me. Definitely. Yeah, and you've ended up giving giving some professional card concerts from or for the Vancouver Society yeah. since then as well, right? So yeah, for sure. I mean, I I have so much to thank the society for. It's not like I'm not trying to say that I was just you know sort of like all generous from me on my end. Like I got so yeah. much, and just while I was studying there too, the fact that the society brought in such great artists, I met Carlo because Daniel brought him in through the society, you know, and then yeah. I went and moved to Europe and studied with him. So like you know. Um, these organizations really are the like life and soul of what we do um, in each of our locations, I think, in a lot of ways. Yeah, I think, you know, like, um, you can kind of think of yourself as like a node in the world, right? Where like you're a connection between you and like X amount of other people. And then you need these organization organizations to connect the nodes together, right? Yeah. So when you do that, then you have then you start connecting everyone else's connections together and that's how you build like a network and a community right mm -hmm. so to try yeah Sorry. yeah to try and i was just going to say that like you can't really build a, it's really difficult to build a community around like one person yeah. but if you can have like a group of people working to build everyone is trying to build a community around that and that's how it succeeds right that's why i also don't understand this like competitive mindset of like if you move to a city you're like okay who are the, what other guitarists are here and you know like what's my quote-unquote competition and people talk this way sometimes and i just i don't see a how that's helpful and b how that actually represents reality because like you know if you stay in a place long enough and hustle and find students 
it's going to be better for you and the other person in the in the city who's also giving concerts and teaching if you connect together have you, each other work with each other's students from time to time maybe do like ex like you know uh like collaborate with someone to bring in somebody else to play and you know you, if that person needs someone to cover for their gig they can ask you and i don't know there's just so many reasons why connecting to others and seeing them as a collaborative partner in the same location rather than a comp competitive competitor there's so many reasons that yeah. that's valuable for your development and for like your career and for that person too and i don't know yeah well when you first come into like a city like you said like when you're coming from that outside perspective i understand that mindset because it the world looks like a, a world of scarcity right like it doesn't look like there's a lot going on yeah but what happens is when you start investing time into community then when you have a larger community, it starts to pull more people into it, right? And it, it becomes e easier to be interested in that in that community because there's more interesting things happening inside of that community. Mm -hmm. And you have more interesting artists and more interesting projects and it like self perpetuates and grows, right? Yeah. And then once you have that kind of growth, it becomes a lot easier for everyone to benefit from that. Yeah. Students and professionals, student like, also, like as a professional, like I think most of the like in Vancouver, most a lot of the teaching I was able to get during my master's, like working at specific schools and stuff, was because I made friends with guitarists and they moved or they needed to downsize the number of teaching jobs they were doing, and they you know suggested me. David suggested me for the BC Conservatory when I worked there for two years after he um, had like he he had too many students and he was like I need someone else to come in and help out here, you know, basically. Um, yeah. And because I went for lunch with him a few times when I first got into town, because I sort of like knew he was in the area and managed to, you know, say like, let's meet up and hang out kind of thing. And I don't know, I just, yeah, I don't understand the not wanting to connect with people and um, yeah, the mentality. But I, I get that, you know, it does seem scarce, the opportunity, so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, um, the Vancouver Society is awesome, and I hope you guys have many years of success. Um, well, I hope so too. Yeah, you guys are doing great stuff. Um, although in the time of COVID, it's uh, it's complicated. Yeah, it's it's really tough. Yeah. Uh, let's do some. Would you rather, Alec? Okay. So I'm gonna just give you some uh, terrible options, and you're gonna pick between them and tell me why. So would you okay. rather would you rather play a concert when you haven't slept for an entire day or you haven't eat, eaten for an entire day? Oh, that's that's tough. Uh, I think I would go with without having to sleep uh, because I get really grumpy when I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> You'll just like start abusing the audience verbally. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Also, I mean, I feel like without sleep, you still get adrenaline when you perform. So, yeah, when I when I don't eat, sometimes I get a little shaky. Right. Yeah. OK. Would you rather go on stage and play an entire concert in your pajamas or would you rather go on stage and play a concert really sick, like coughing and sneezing and all that kind of stuff? And let's pretend that there's no COVID because that is yeah. the answer. I would definitely uh, prefer to go in my pajamas because I really don't mind <laughs> being <Okay>. comfy. <laughs> You're like, it's fine. Um, it's my new look, everybody. Um, would you yeah, rather... play a lullaby at the end? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Would you rather have your guitar go out of tune during a performance, or would you rather have a really big memory slip and have to restart a section? Oh, that's the that's a kind of a tough one because I think you know I think as a hmm, as a performer, probably the the memory slip is scarier. Mm -hmm. uh, it that that's tough because it also kind of depends on what the music is, also. Right. Let's you say know, it's like if like, I'm, it's huge, or it's just like you start a phrase and then you just have a big mess up and you have to restart the phrase. It's like one bar you repeat or something. Yeah, I mean, I mean more like if I'm playing, um, if I'm playing like some harmony, like if I'm playing a piece that has like a lot of extended harmonies and stuff, I think the tuning's not gonna matter so much as if I were to like play like you know like Mozart or something where the 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 harmonic structure is like really simple. Mm. You know, yeah. like if you're playing, if you're playing like Brower and you go out of tune, depending on the piece, people might not even notice. <laughs> right. It might be okay. Yeah. Or less, less yeah. disruptive. 
Yeah, I think I'd have to. I think I'd uh, go with the the tuning on that question. Okay. Uh, would you rather learn and memorize in one week for a performance? Which of these two pieces? Um, and let's say that you never played them before, because I know you've played one of these pieces. But would you rather have to learn and memorize in a week, Iron Quiz, or the Roberto Sierra Sonata? Oh God. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> I don't think I could do either of those feats. <laughs> let's say, okay, let's say that you could take music on stage with you, but like, you know. Yeah. Um, I guess I would say the RN West, because then yeah. it means I'm getting a chance to perform the RN West. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's okay. That's sort of circumnavigating the, the point of the question, but that works. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh okay um would you rather sight re okay let's say that you you have a concert like so this is related you have a concert with orchestra okay it's like a big deal it's like a big orchestra you go and either you play the concert sight reading from the music let's say the iron quiz or the ponce concerto let's say ponce concerto or you go and you play perfectly best performance of your life ever but you very noticeably shit your pants during the performance Oh man! And so, like the whole audience, the orchestra, everybody knows, but you just like pull it off. Yeah, I think I, I go with the the shitting the pants one. Okay, just because then you're yeah. still professional because you pulled. Off yeah, it doesn't really like that doesn't embarrass me so much. Okay, because <laughs> I, I feel like pe yeah. I feel like that way people are still getting what they paid for too. You know, <laughs> a good show, you mean? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's a memorable evening, I guess, for everybody. Um, yeah, you have a story to tell after that, and I guess like after you do that, then there's like nothing. There's like nothing to be afraid of anymore. <laughs> yeah, it's true, and also it's like, well, that's the guy who played well, but that happened, but still like played great, you know. Yeah. Um, whereas sight reading would just be like a disaster. <laughs> okay, well now that we've got the hard questions out of the way, um, <laughs> let's listen to the third prelude that you wrote. Um, are, are there only going to be four of these or are you going to write more later? Oh, I'm going to write more. I th I'm going to try, I don't know. I don't want to like dedicate myself in words to doing something I might not be interested in like a few months, but right. I'll try to do like a whole set of them. Okay, cool. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to publish them in groups of four, I think. Oh, okay. So you'll put, okay. Four and four and four. Yeah. That, that makes sense. Um, and this one is. Uh, this one is uh, uh, this one. I'll dedicate to Daniel Bolshoi. Um, it's a little, little bit more in sort of narrative fat than the other ones, so it doesn't have such a strictly defined form. Uh, sort of some of the textures and everything just remind me of Daniel and the harmonies. Um, yeah, there's about that. It has a. This is the only one of the preludes that has sort of like a little cadenza section so that sort of represents the time of studying concertos with daniel um yeah he's big on concertos yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly right so there's like a little mini quasi cadenza in there that's sort of uh pays homage to daniel on that one cool awesome all right prelude number three let's listen Sorry, everyone, that's number four. Uh, I put the wrong one in here. Uh, I don't think so, let's see. Okay, sorry, everybody. Let's, there we go. Okay.
Wonderful. Very nice. Cool. Nice work. Sorry, everybody, for getting the wrong prelude. Laurie Rasmussen says, LOL, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's my grandma. Hi. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, beautiful. Nice little cadenza. Um, since you're a, you're a teacher, Alec, um, yes. what wisdom do you have to impart to people about practicing or about technique or what have you been focusing on lately for yourself or your students? Um, so, yeah, I, I wish there was like a really direct question because it's so, so different for every single person, you know? Mm -hmm. um, let me think. I think something that's been beneficial for me, if I try to like say it that way, uh, you know, you have to really know what kind of person you are and have like sort of a self awareness around that and just be like really honest with what your strengths and weaknesses are. So for me, I tend to be really unorganized and uh, I definitely tend to lead to the introverted side. So what's helped me the most with my de development is knowing that those are two of my weaknesses and trying to be really proactive in having strategies that address that. So being involved with the Guitar Society and forcing yourself to do like events and, and play open mics and things like that uh, were really proactive steps I took to overcome sort of some of my introvertedness. It's still like a big part of who I am, but you know, you have to be lots of different things if you want to be a professional musician right mm -hmm. and uh, that's something i started doing even as like a teenager and uh being more organized i find i like to keep a lot of uh little lists like to-do lists so i have to-do lists for um the things i need to do outside of music that way when i'm sitting down and practicing it's, I don't have like these distracting thoughts popping in my head, like, oh, I need to go do that. But I also keep lists uh, on the pieces I'm learning, which I find is like particularly useful if you have a lot of different sets, like if you're playing some chamber music and then some solo stuff, and then you have like this other thing you got asked, asked to do. It's good to have some way of organizing all of that. And I like to keep sort of a, a little journal. It just It's just that like for a recital, I like to list all my pieces it was a big piece i'll may have like some subsections and then on the top i have like the dates listed and, and just being able to check or i use like smiley faces to see how i feel about each section to track uh how that's working uh over time just so at a glance i can see like what i'm neglecting and not neglecting because i think as people we really have this like flaw uh, our memory is a lot shorter and more focused than we than we like to think it is right so you think that oh it hasn't been that long since i worked on this but actually when you see it written down for you you realize like oh yeah actually compared to other things i'm doing i'm really neglecting this this year right mm -hmm. <laughs> so i think those are some strategies that i always try to get my students to do uh the first year is having some way of tracking what you're doing and uh, i've done it like with technical work and stuff in the in the past as well it's not something you have to do all the time for everything but if you've never experimented with like journaling or keeping some kind of method to track it i think it's, it's something you should invest in it's valuable yeah yeah that's great i um i do the written list thing too also i've been trying lately to have it's not exactly the same but to have different sort of piles of music or different sections in my binder or in my folders where it's like like for example here I on, on the desk I just have like four different piles one is like repertoire that I've played in the past that I want to sort of maintain but I'm not performing right now that I just have to play every once in a while to keep it like or work on the hard bits every once in a while to keep it there then I have pieces that I'm preparing to record in the next week for I'm making some YouTube videos since I have a little extra time in August while I don't have as many students to teach because people are on holiday then I have a pile that's like music that I have to learn for a gig that has a special theme in October, which is all Catalonian music, you know? And then I have my stuff that's like my chamber music stuff with um, Jessica, like for our duo. So I know what you mean with trying to have different like um, categories and trying to make sure that I go e try to go evenly through all those categories, which is difficult, but yeah. 
Yeah. And I mean, you know, as like, since you have this recording coming up in a week, obviously that's going to be a bigger priority than something yeah. that's happening further down the line. So you can focus more on that, of course, like it's not yeah. meant to be something that's like rigid necessarily, but having some way of tracking what you're doing will let you know if you're being like realistic with your expectations as well. Yeah. And in a broader sense too, you can understand like, okay, it takes me this long to prepare this sort of uh, recital or whatever performance to this degree of, you know, of perfection or, or whatever. So you can, you can better like gauge yourself that way. For sure. Yeah. I am. Um... Yeah, and like, uh, for example, I'm doing, for these YouTube videos, I'm recording four or five videos over this, this, like, starting last week, going into next week, and just like, recording them at different times, and so, yeah, like you said, it's like, I know, okay, tomorrow I'm going to record this little piece, I have to like, practice that a lot more today, and I don't know, it's just, yeah, it's always a balancing act, and you never really get through everything on your list, right, especially as you become more and more of a professional, and you have more and more responsibilities, your list becomes more <laughs> unattainable in some ways, but it's like, it's still, for me at least, it still feels good to check things off and like scratch them out or whatever. I know that I've done that number of things in one day. I don't know, but that's really valuable. Yeah, um, especially with something like music, it can be kind of like abstract what we're doing. Mm -hmm. So having that that concrete realization that at the end of the day, I, you know, I put this piece and this piece together and, the, and I actually did something like concrete you know, if you look at it that way, it takes quite a long time to build something. So if you have some map to navigate that, okay, I got put this piece of the puzzle here and this piece of puzzle there. And then when, then it starts to all come together where if you don't have that and it just, it's sort of in the ether, I think you'll end up running into a lot of things like a week or two out before, from your recital where like, oh man, like I thought it was further along and I'm not actually. Right, yeah. <laughs> I mean, of course, there's also the thing of like doing run throughs to check because then you realize when you do a run through what's actually not working. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I yeah. would say too, like, uh, I think a lot of uh, students, they hear you say something like that and they think like, okay, like when I'm done my undergrad degree, I'll, I'll start doing that kind of thing, right? But realizing that all of these strategies and preparations are things that also take practice they're not just something you do, mm -hmm. but they're actually something you have to practice doing in itself, right? Just like the way you learn to play guitar. Also, once you get out of school and you actually have to make a living, if you're gonna teach enough students and play enough gigs that you can make a living, um, <laughs> then you're gonna need some of these habits. Otherwise, you're just never gonna learn new pieces or like be able to push yourself still artistically. Um, and it becomes much more of a balancing act once you're actually paying your bills through music. Um, yeah, for sure. Which that's a learning curve. I mean, in some ways, I'm happy that I was sort of forced to I didn't have like a lot of financial support during school. So I think I learned quite early how to like, make enough through teaching and performing um, that I could like survive, but also like do what I had to to develop myself as a musician, which is a really hard balance. But it's, an, it's a necessary one if you're staying in this business for very long, right? So yeah, I don't know. But yeah, the skills are hard to develop. I mean, it's, it's just it's hard being an adult no matter what, but especially when you're trying to balance learning, like improving yourself on an instrument. Yeah, I think another thing too is like um, sort of spending some time about thinking about what what is valuable and what you have to offer is mm -hmm. really important because a lot of times it's easy for someone who's up and coming to look at people who are so much further down the line and have done so much more than you and say like, oh, like my skills aren't valuable until I've like achieved that level. But even if you're someone who only has a few years of guitar practice, if you know a lot more than someone else, then your skills are still valuable to that person, right? Mm -hmm. So trying to learn to give, to give what you have along the way, like every step of the way is really important. Also like recognizing that you're, you're like, what's the word? You're like um, assessment of how, how much someone else has to offer is very skewed when you look at yourself also. 
Uh, yeah, exactly. And even when you look back at your past, like, I don't know, I, you know, sometimes I forget that, like, I think it's easy in your own case to forget what the accomplishments you've had, the things you've won or the concerts you've played that were really great or made an impact on others because you don't remember that impact because it, was, it wasn't made on you, right? But when someone else looks at you, they see a lot more than you do, I think, so. Yeah, do you feel like uh, during this COVID uh, situation where it's like the breaks have been put on a little bit, you've been able to do a little bit more self-reflecting and. Yeah, there's definitely stuff where I'm like, wow, I was actually doing a lot more than I might have really realized in some ways. Like even just like the gigs I was playing, because you know, you always have the feeling like any day now they're gonna figure out that I'm just a fraud and these gigs are gonna stop coming, <laughs> you know, and this like, and you also feel like, oh, I'm not playing enough concerts, blah, 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 whatever. But then when you don't play any, you're suddenly like, actually, I was playing a decent number of like performances, you know? Yeah, exactly. Like you're always wanting to do more, right? Like you're always wanting to put more on your plate. But then when you have nothing, you're like, oh, like the yeah. plate I had before was looking pretty good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, I've been very, very lucky that with online teaching, like my students have been great about it. And I've even got some new ones and they've been like, everyone's been really cool about the, I mean, you know, of course you lose some people with a thing like that, but like, I just mean, I'm, I've been incredibly lucky that I have students who are so passionate and willing to like still go through the technological challenges of online lessons and stuff. So in some ways I've had to grow certain areas of my like business and practice, you know, so that's yeah. a bit of a blessing in disguise, but it's still it's just a hard situation. I feel mostly, I feel really bad for organizations that rely on performing. Like that's so hard. Um, like us individual artists, I think we can weather this, a lot of us, you know, but I'm worried a little bit about some of the arts organizations that may not weather it so well. Yeah, the Guitar Society, we'll do um, a few sort of streaming concerts and things like that, but it's really like the bigger ones that have like ensembles and casts like the, you know, the orchestras and the operas and stuff that are going to be really hard hit. Yeah, for sure, especially ones that have like proper employees on like salary and stuff right yeah um, so you know, like administration and everything yeah because i mean them. most guitar organizations are essentially volunteer run right like mm -hmm. so yeah that's a bit different too because those people can kind of just take time off until yeah it's reset and stuff so and it's, it's made so much worse by the fact that we don't know exactly when the end of it would be you know if it, if it was just like okay this is the thing here we're going to just take a year like you know back in march we're just going to take a year off and then after right. a year it'll be okay but because it has that know, like yeah i'm supposed to has, perform at this conference in portugal in march the 21st century thing which got moved from november and you know my duo partner nathan bredesen we're in a duo across well he's in canada and i'm in the netherlands but we we do projects together and meet up and play and he's supposed to come for it and you know we're trying to think about trying to get some other concerts in the area and it's just like it's just hard to know when you're planning stuff like you know at this point is it worth like <laughs> looking for gigs when who knows what the situation will be i guess it's always worth it to look but it's kind of hard to get out of that like waiting to see what happens mentality you know yeah um, so it's interesting but you know i think we'll be uh we'll be stronger for it in the end because i think when it comes back people are going to be so much more appreciative of it yeah enthusiastic and appreciative of let's hope yeah and i i've taken this time to learn a lot about how i learned how to live stream doing this thing um i've met a lot of people doing this this show i learned a lot about recording i've got some new microphones and new software and i'm you know developing my skills that way so yeah this is great do you have the audio of this uh, available as in like a podcast format not yet that's actually on my to-do list is to turn all of them yeah. into audio and put them out on like um yeah, all the platforms. Yeah, I helped. Uh, we actually, like for the Guitar Society, we started to do a podcast and we had an interview with uh, Renee. And, oh, cool. <laughs> and that was the only one we did because then the next artist didn't want to do it. And then, the, you know, essentially COVID hit after that. Right. So uh, we have like one, one podcast, but it's actually, it's not too hard to like syndicate it. It just takes like a an afternoon or an evening or something to yeah i wonder if they'd have any trouble with the the playing um of copyrighted music i mean i know it's i'm within fair use because it involves commentary and education on uh, like playing the clips but i don't know if the algorithms would have trouble with that but i should yeah. really just I would, do it yeah i would just do it and 
Yeah. Just see what happens. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I think what I'll probably do is like at the end of every season, like every couple months, my plan is to do like two or three month seasons. Um, going forward, I'm doing it once a week now. I did a lot when the pandemic first started, but I'd like to like, you know, um, finish a season maybe and then like just process all the audio at once or something. We'll see. Because it's just a lot to, although maybe every week it'll be simple for me to just throw it up there. Anyways, yeah. I'm not going to talk about that right now, but. <laughs> yeah. yeah i'm learning things we're all learning things in this time you know this difficult time for the arts um we're all trying new avenues and stuff um well let's play the lightning round alec and then if there's any quest final questions from the audience or things you want to talk about um then we'll wrap up from there and listen to the last prelude before the end okay um what's the what's the lightning round the lightning round is i give you two options and you have to answer as fast as possible Okay. You okay. Spain yeah. or Italy? Uh, Spain. Scarlatti or Bach? Uh, Bach. Vanilla or chocolate? Uh, chocolate. Uh, solo or chamber? Chamber. Mammals or reptiles? Mammals. Jacob Sayer or Joel Thompson? <laughs> well, Jacob moved away, so I'm going with Joel here. Oh, right. That's right. <laughs> His traitor. Sorry, Jacob. Traitor to Vancouver. Uh, okay, I don't think you'd mind. Um, cats or dogs? Oh, dogs, I guess. Beer or wine? Uh, I'm gonna have to go with wine, but that's close. Okay, Vancouver or Montreal? Uh, Vancouver, sorry, Montreal. Uh, pizza or pasta? Uh, pa uh pizza, I'll go with pizza. List or Chopin? Uh, oh, list. Cedar or spruce? Oh man. I think nowadays I'm starting to lean back to uh, spruce. Oh, really? That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> uh, free stroke or rest stroke? Oh, uh, well, you need rest stroke. You need rest stroke, but like, which do you, which do you, okay, anyways, okay. <laughs> I take rest stroke, man. <laughs> that's an answer. Uh, coffee or tea? Uh, coffee. I guess saying rest, rest stroke is speaking like a true Daniel student. Um, yeah <laughs> i'm a trader today because i very rarely use restro i use it in a few like skill type things but not often. you ever practice uh, your arpeggios restro uh i've tried that once or twice and then i was just like screw this <laughs> yeah you got to stick with it it gets better i use it a lot in like um you know sort of slower uh melodies and stuff i use it a lot in like um sort of lush sections to be honest yeah well i mean you know when i'm playing it's more free stroke than rest stroke, of course, but uh, practicing the rest stroke, I, I feel like really enhances your free stroke too. Yeah. Uh, whiskey or gin? Oh man, whiskey, but I just finally found a really good gin. Oh, nice. There's, there's a lot of uh, good gin in the Netherlands also. Um, yeah. Debussy or Ravel? Oh, I like uh, Ravel. Okay, breakfast or dinner? I'm going to have to go with breakfast there. Nice. Uh, Alberta or BC? Oh, man. Some of these are you just know, to piss people off. Yeah, <laughs> but are you talking like where, where do I want to live or the it's landscape? Just, it's, just or? A, it's a lightning round. You, I, okay. I don't explain it. You just have to pick. Uh, I'm going to go with Alberta. I have to go with Alberta. Oh, man. So loyal to your roots. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Alberta boy. Okay. Um, B South Park or The Simpsons? Oh, so Park, for sure. Yeah, for sure, obviously. Campanella or regular scales? Oh, Campanella all Dude, the way. Dude, me too, all the way. <laughs> uh, Campanella reststroke, right? <laughs> Just <kidding>. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Soar or Giuliani? Uh, ooh, it's going to go with Soar. Okay. But I, I used to never like Giuliani, but I'm starting to like find an appreciation there that I didn't have. I'm the like, opposite. I can't really stand sore to be honest but i love yeah. Giuliani. And I, like, I like listening to Giuliani. i don't know it's just so fun yeah i don't know okay um sweet or salty oh uh sweet i guess tremolo or scales tremolo rodrigo like or daniel or ponce rodrigo tedesco or ponce oh man uh ponce okay ponce is great um concert they're all great class uh concert i guess okay yeah. restoration of the composer's intention or personal interpretation Oof. uh 
I'm going to go with personal interpretation there. Okay. Interesting. Reem or Segovia? Uh, well, that's tough. I'm going to go with uh, Reem, I guess. Yeah. Mountains or beaches? Uh, mountains. Carbon or nylon, the most important one? Oh, nylon. I'm going to have to go with nylon, but... Oh, really? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so disappointed in you. Just yeah, I, I know you would be. <laughs> <laughs> I actually I, I use nylon on my uh, Dominelli, my like traditional spruce top Dominelli. Yeah, because it's too bright with carbon. Like it, uh, maybe carbon third string, maybe or sorry, uh, yeah, third string, maybe. Yeah, but, like um, usually it's just straight nylon. But like on my 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 rust chest on lattice cedar it's a cedar so it's quite warm so the carbon is, is actually really nice i don't know yeah like i'm starting to i'm starting yeah for sure it depends on the guitar i'm starting to experiment more with carbon now again so maybe ask me again in a month and we'll see yeah yeah it really depends on the guitar um even the type of carbon strings like i really don't savarez carbon really don't sound good on my chest i don't think but i I've, I've been playing a guitar that i trying out that's uh, belongs to Brett Gunther and um, that guitar like he had Alliance um, Severus trebles on it when I got it and I was like they sound so nice on this guitar um, right yeah so I don't know depends any hoodles um, anyone in the chat have any last questions let us know is there anything you want to address Alec that we haven't covered uh, no thanks Mike that was a great conversation yeah for sure um, anything controversial you want to say so you you can become like canceled and it'll help your career and stuff, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know, man. It seems like so easy nowadays to have yeah. that happen. Maybe it already happened sometime in this conversation. Yeah, and I perhaps. don't even realize it. <laughs> perhaps. But I think it, it's often uh, more helpful than hindering you too. <laughs> Just yeah. Um, <laughs> anyhow. Um, cool. Okay. Well, we're going to listen to the fourth prelude. I think we're going to sign off here and then play it um, and people can um, let, like hear the, the piece that the stream plays out. Thank you everyone for watching. Um, one more time, just check out the Patreon and the PayPal link. Um, donations from the show, I should have said this earlier, will we'll go directly to Alec, the artist, um, as this is a difficult time for everybody. And uh, this is the last episode of season two, I guess. Um, oh, cool. I haven't made the September order yet. But I'll be back in September, October. I might start in the second week of September because it's going to be going to be a busy start to the month for me. Um, but I will do four in September, even if I do some of them like twice in a week. And yeah, I'll be back with season three. If there's anything you see in the show or anything you think would be good in the show, let me know because I'd like to like mix it up a bit and change the format some or add some new stuff. So if anyone has any ideas, tell me. And um, yeah. I, I think I'm going to wait to release the list of guests until later this month to give people a bit of time off. Um, thanks everyone for watching and thank you, Alec, for being here. It's been wonderful. Yeah, thank you for staying so busy doing this for everyone and everything else you've been doing. Oh yeah, no worries. And um, I hope I'm in Vancouver again soon and we can hang out. And uh, Yeah, that'd be I nice. Would also encourage anyone who's looking for a school to consider applying with Alec at UBC. It's a great school. Um, and he's a great teacher and uh, I think cool things are happening in Vancouver and uh, you know I'm glad that you're you're there keeping keeping things rolling along with everybody else great thanks man okay let's listen to the fourth prelude do you want to talk about this piece quickly before we play it uh yeah really quickly so this one I dedicated to uh my first like real guitar teacher Jose Fairman um it's a pretty short one it's the most humorous of them all has like some little grace notes and uh, has this like simple melody in the top but a lot of action on the inside voice and then this middle section where the inner voice sort of takes over and then transitions back and also that the way it transitions back is kind of uh, humorous and fun too so it's a little bit light and yeah just this one big contrast cool nice all right let's listen to prelude number four uh, and thank you everyone for watching. Tune back in in September for season three. And uh, give Alec a follow at the links in the description. And you can also download the first prelude there in the description. That's right. All right. Thanks, Alec. Let's listen to the last uh, prelude before we finish off here.